G'day and welcome back to Counterculture, where we showcase the very, very best of what The Spectator Australia and the Institute of Public Affairs have to offer. Today we're taking a look overseas. Dr David Adler joins us to talk about his Spectator Australia piece, telling you the real story about what is happening in the Middle East. Very important interview there. Morris Newman tells us why Joe Biden's America is increasingly weak in the eyes of China. James McPherson talks to us about a recent win in the war on wokeness. Rowan Dean slams Scott Morrison's proposal for vaccine passports. And Sarah Dudley joins us to talk about this weekend's front cover as always. Let's do it. just saw is right now a daily reality for the nine million men, women and children living in the state of Israel. The warning siren, meaning that there are just seconds to make it to the nearest bomb shelter before the rocket hits. Well, that is, of course, unless Israel's ingenious Iron Dome missile defense system hits it first. Now, that's on a recent video you just saw, by the way. It was taken nine years ago. It's reality. It's what peace-loving Israeli citizens have been dealing with for years, decades, 74 years, in fact, ever since neighbouring Arab countries invaded the fledgling state of Israel in 1947, attempting to wipe it off the map. Now, I'm telling you all this because this is one of the few media outlets in the country that tells this side of the story. Other outlets, for reasons I frankly never understood, just adopt the narrative of the usual left-wing ferals. And therein lies the reason why this conflict is such a hot-button issue. It's about more than just the lives of innocent Israeli citizens or about the continued survival of the world's only Jewish state. It's symbolic of the perennial conflict between freedom and tyranny. After all, you know, the left has never met a successful liberal democracy it didn't hate. And the Middle East's only successful liberal democracy is Israel a free and democratic country with a market economy that gives more legal rights and better living standards to its citizens than almost every country for miles around it, underpinned by traditional and religious values? I mean, if you're a miserable lefty, what's not to hate? And so the same people who think that Australia Day is a symbol of colonialist oppression and the US Constitution is a symbol of colonialist oppression, well, naturally, they think that the state of Israel is a symbol of colonialist oppression. It's wrong, it's ignorant, and as I've said, it's entirely predictable. But as long as media outlets, who should know better, run with this idiotic narrative, we at The Spectator Australia will always set the record straight. Enter Dr David Adler, who has written a sensational piece on the issue in this weekend's edition. So let's hear from him now, from Spectator Australia contributor and president of the Patriotic Australian Jewish Association, Dr. David Adler. David, how are you? That's got to be the most uh, effusive introduction I've ever had, uh, <laughs> Gideon. So if I wasn't good before, I'm good now. Excellent, excellent. Now, I just loved your piece. Uh, obviously, I follow uh, what happens in Israel very, very closely. I've been following this conflict very closely. Uh, but there's mm-hmm. things in there that even I didn't really appreciate. But let's start with the narrative that this was all started by uh, invasion and dispossession and uh, Palestinian people being booted off their land. Let's clear up that myth once and for all that th- these were squatters who weren't paying rent. It had nothing to do with any territorial uh, dispute. Yes, you, I mean, you, you're talking about uh, the small number of evictions which are going through the courts in an area called Sheikh Jarrah in, uh, in Jerusalem. It used to be called by its Hebrew name, mm. uh, Shimon Hatzadik, uh, before the Jordanian uh, occupation, and mm. that was an illegal occupation. But the original Jewish ownership, which has title going back to commercial transactions from 1875, was demonstrated through the courts. Um, this has been in progress for decades, frankly, Mm. as a complex property transaction and dispute uh, sometimes drags out. So to say that this is the cause of Hamas uh, launching 3,000 rockets into Israel is beyond far-fetched. It's just just nonsense. 
What what you've said in the piece, which I didn't fully appreciate, is that this is more to do with an internal Palestinian power play. Now, that's a fascinating dynamic. So perhaps you could talk us through the different factions that are involved here and how this has spilled over into uh, launching thousands of rockets on Israeli civilians. Well, the, the, the context one needs to understand, the framework, is that the last conflict between Israel and Hamas was 2014. Mm. So we now have this huge breakout of conflict. Um, Why now? Uh, What provoked it? Well, one of the things that is undoubtedly involved is that with the change of US administration, uh, the Biden administration was urging the Palestinian Authority, which is headed by Mahmoud Abbas, who's been incidentally uh, in that office currently in his 17th year of a four-year term. Correct. They want to restore the financial support and diplomatic support that President Trump had cut. But it's hard to do that when you're dealing with something which is so obviously a dictatorship. So they urged that long overdue elections should be held. And these were promised. They were supposed to have been held this month in May. But when it became very obvious that uh, his faction would lose and that the result of an election would be even worse, that Hamas and the Palestinian Islamic Jihad, both of which are registered prescribed terrorist organisations in many countries, including Australia, Mm. they they would have a smashing victory the election was cancelled. So immediately upon cancelling the election, uh, the rivals to Abbas started planning violence. They did it in an orchestrated way, initially on the most sensitive part of the area, which is the Temple Mount. And we have pictures. uh, They're on the internet. They're not hard to find. Of stockpiling of rocks, of fireworks, Molotov cocktails, Mm in the Dome of the Rock and in Al-Aqsa Mosque, which were used for riots. And that's what initiated the the current violence. It was orchestrated, it was planned initially on the Temple Mount, it spread elsewhere in Jerusalem and then elsewhere around the country. And this was the excuse because, oh, when the Israeli authorities had to intervene and start to restore order, uh, this is the excuse for Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad to start launching their rockets. We didn't see any of this when Donald Trump was in office, did we? Mm. Uh, why was I mean, you articulated a bit about that in the article, but what exactly has changed after January 20th this year? Well, there's been two major changes. Uh, the first is that Trump was the most supportive US president of Israel as an ally. Yep. Uh, and anybody who decided that they would like to launch a campaign of aggression and terrorism, uh, knew that they were facing not just Israel, but also a very active Israeli-US alliance, uh, diplomatically, in international forums, etc. So that has weakened substantially. I mean, the US is still a friend of Israel, of course, but it's backtracking. It's backtracking in the diplomatic field, particularly with Iran, and seems to be keen to appease Iran. The other thing that's happened is that Trump cut the money flow from the US. He stopped uh, the payments to the Palestinian Authority and to UNRWA, which is the UN agency that provides the teaching, because he saw them as unhelpful and in desperate need of reform. Mm. Uh, The number one item for reform was what's called the pay for slay program, yep. where Palestinian Authority will pay people who killed Jews in Israel. It's just obscene. Now, without requiring any reform, President Biden has restored the, the money flow and has recently released uh, 235 million US dollars 
to uh, towards Palestinian causes. It's also the fact that uh, the you know people think oh you give it to the United Nations Relief Agency that's fine they'll uh, administer it properly. Well, no, uh, they found Hamas weaponry in, in UN run schools. There are uh, extremist Islamic clerics who come in and, t- and preach death to Jews and all sorts of things in UN run schools. Uh, this money doesn't always end up. Well, it doesn't end up uh, you know actually on humanitarian relief. It ends up funding terrorism as well. The proof of the pudding is in the eating here. Uh, Hamas control the teachers' union. Mm. 16 out of 16 executive places in the last uh, teachers' union election in UNRWA schools went to Hamas members. You interview the kids as they exit the schools, and this has been done. You know, what did you learn today? What are your attitudes to um, to Jews in Israel, and you'll get answers from the kids saying, oh, I'm ready to be a suicide bomber. I want to drive a car uh, into the Jews. I'm ready to take a knife and go stabbing. And these are the uh, results of an UNRWA education, unfortunately. And one of the most distressing things about the, uh, the current conflict that's underway is that we've had a whole generation yeah. that have been brought up on hatred on uh, glorifying terrorism. And we've even seen Arab Israelis uh, forming violent gangs, burning cars, uh, burning businesses, burning synagogues, attacking uh, people who look like Orthodox Jews in in Jerusalem. Um, And that's a, a serious problem which Israel is now going to have to confront. Um, They're very good at dealing with external enemies. Mm. How they're going to deal with whatever proportion of Arab Israeli citizens who have now turned, um, that's going to be uh, a really, really difficult issue in our view. If you consider what happened at the last ALP conference where the Labor Party decided to incorporate into its platform the unconditional priority recognition of a state of Palestine, something that doesn't exist, and rejected efforts of reasonable people like Michael Danby to condition the recognition. So it's unconditional. What's happening in Israel um, illustrates how misguided the Labor platform Mm. on the Middle East now is. It's just nuts. They're embracing Hamas. They're embracing Palestinian Islamic Jihad, which are, frankly... Now, the dominant forces, um, despite there not being an election, had an election been held, they would be um, in pseudo-government uh, prescribed terrorist organisations. So unless there's major reform, uh, the ALP has in its platform a significant foreign policy liability. Thank God for organisations like the Australian Jewish Association setting the record straight on this stuff. Excellent, excellent piece uh, in The Spectator Australia this weekend and uh, looking forward to having you back on Counterculture soon. Thank you, Gideon, and may you go from strength to strength. And a reminder that Counterculture is available on the podcast platforms as well. Find us on Spotify, iTunes, or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're liking this show, you will love Morning Double Shot, a daily edition of Spectator Australia goodness brought to you by editor Terry Barnes. Terry's up bright and early, scanning the news and offering you your first shot of comment for the day and helping you make sense of whatever madness the morning news brings. Plus, your daily highlights of what the Spectator Australia is saying about the issues that matter. And make sure you give this video a like and hit that subscribe button down below. New people are finding this channel on YouTube each and every day and that's because of your help in beating that big tech algorithm and helping us get our message out. And now it's time to hear from Editor-in-Chief of The Spectator Australia, Rowan Dean. Rowan, how are you? I'm great, Gideon. How are you going, mate? I'm going very, very well. Now, fantastic editorial this week, and it's actually on something we discussed a little while ago with Craig Kelly, uh, and it was about vaccine passports, something that was being contemplated in Britain and not at all discussed in Australia, something that even I thought couldn't or wouldn't happen in Australia. But sure enough, the latest incursion to our civil liberties and our rights and freedoms is landing on our doorstep. So over to you. What did you have to say? about this monstrous proposal in this weekend's edition? Well, Gideon, as I said in my editorial, uh, one tries to avoid hyperbole and one tries to avoid uh, trotting out uh, extremist comparisons or metaphors. But in this case, uh, 
the idea that Scott Morrison has put forward that uh, we could see vaccine passports preventing Australians from travelling within Australia over state borders uh, is an absolute abuse of human rights and I argue uh, potentially uh, a crime against humanity. And this is based, Gideon, on uh, the well-known and well-established conventions following World War II. There are any number of the Geneva Convention and other health protocols and, and, and national and international laws, uh, which arose out of World War II and the horrific uh, experimentation upon Jews by the Nazis and others, um, uh, medical treatments, uh, horrific stories. We've seen echoes of that uh, throughout uh, uh, other totalitarian regimes, including right up to today, uh, if the stories are true, and I, there's no reason to suppose they're not, coming out of Xinjiang province and uh, forced uh, mm. sterilizations, forced medical treatments upon the Uyghurs and so on. So it's an absolute fundamental of international law that no government or no government bureaucracy, Gideon, can coerce an individual citizen into taking a medical treatment, a drug. That is a fundamental that arose out of World War II. It's a fundamental medical principle. It's a fundamental legal principle. It's a fundamental of human rights. No government, no bureaucracy can mandate or coerce, and that's the critical thing, an individual into taking a drug against their better judgment or against their will. A uh, vaccine passport, you can argue the case for the international borders, you can argue the case that we should not be allowing people into the country who have not been vaccinated. That's a well-established, uh, we've all been vaccinated to go to, you know, uh, Africa or wherever. No one has a problem with that. You can argue the rights and wrongs on, on whether Australian citizens who happen to be overseas should be prevented from coming home if they haven't been vaccinated. I would argue that they should be allowed in so long as they abide by normal quarantine. But that's a separate issue. We're talking about internal borders within Australia. Now, what you are basically doing is you're allowing the government to blackmail individuals, free Australians, uh, who for whatever reason, let's just take a classic example, a, a traumatised uh, grandparent who hasn't seen their grandkids uh, for the last year because of, uh, because of COVID, is now told that they may only see their offspring if they have a vaccine. That is coercion mm. using blackmail, using emotional manipulation. You can argue the same if you said to a business which is suffering and which relies on, on, on the interstate trade, okay, you can now trade uh, interstate so long as you have this vaccine. Again, that is an unacceptable level of coercion. I'm all for governments persuading individuals to take the vaccine, putting forward the case, making the vaccine available. That's normal standard procedure, but it's a very fine line between incentivizing and coercion. And this idea of a vaccine passport operating uh, that prevents, that only allows you to travel into state for whatever reason, so long as you have had the vaccine, is an unacceptable abuse of government. It is coercion and it falls under, in my opinion, the uh, Geneva definition, Geneva Convention definition, uh, basically of a crime against humanity. You're right. And, you know, this whole wretched COVID saga has been a series of lines that I never thought I would see crossed. When the government chucked thousands of people out of work and had dole queues stretching around the block, that was a line that I never thought we'd see crossed. When uh, people were tackled to the ground for not wearing a bloody face mask, I thought uh, that was a line we'd never see crossed. When somebody, when a pregnant woman was arrested in Ballarat over a Facebook post, uh, when the Australian government basically criminalised Australian citizens returning to their own country. That, I thought, was the killing of the verse born in the 10 plagues that is the COVID sure. saga. Uh, but now we are talking about making participation in civil, in the most basic forms of civil life and basic freedom of movement contingent on a theoretically voluntary medical procedure. Australians won't wear this latest one. Surely they won't. Well, I hope they won't. And Gideon, this is why it's really important that you and others uh, that speak up as loudly and as aggressively as possible on this issue mm. because uh, it is blackmail, it is emotional manipulation, and uh, people will go along with it 
if they feel they have no choice, mm. which is why it's so important. This is a red line in the sand that all freedom-loving Australians must say, no, you cannot cross this line. And that's why I ramp up the hyperbole, and I admit it, to the level of a crime against humanity because, and I say we should be targeting the individuals, the Prime Minister, the Health Minister, Greg Hunt, uh, the individual members of the federal and national cabinets must understand that they as individuals are, uh, are risking their own potential prosecution down the line for crimes against humanity. Mm. I believe it is that serious and I believe we must make them realise it is that serious because you cannot have a situation where we have an un unproven drugs. Mm. Uh, it's bad enough that, uh, you know, this government uh, or our state and federal governments have to various degrees blocked proven safe drugs such as and treatments such as ivermectin and hydro hydroxychloroquine. That's bad enough. But to be coercing or mandating unproven drugs and vaccines, doesn't matter how much they are, Reassure us of their safety. The reality is under the Geneva Convention, the decision must rest between the GP and the patient. That's how it works. That's the basic international law. To be coercing or mandating that individuals are blackmailed into taking drugs against possibly their better judgment mm. uh, is an absolute crime against humanity and our leaders must realise that this is the path they are heading down. Well, you're absolutely right, Rowan. And I think you're actually being a little bit too unfair on yourself uh, by, you know, saying you're ramping up the old hyperbole. I don't think it's actually hyperbolic if it's true and if it's accurate. And that's absolutely what it is. This it would be a crime against humanity. It would certainly be a an unjust uh, and monstrous intrusion into our civil liberties. But I guess we've seen a lot of that in the past 15 months or so. And sadly, I think we'll see a little bit more of it to come. But in the meantime, thank God for the Spectator Australia that is making these arguments because I'm not aware of any other media outlet in the country that is. So to you, Rowan, well done on a fantastic edition and I'll see you next week. Thanks, Gideon. We must fight for freedom. It is the most fundamental and precious commodity we have. And remember, if you want to read more from our outstanding stable of talent at The Spectator Australia, just head on over to spectator.com.au. And if you like what you see, subscribe to The Spectator Australia today to get instant access to all of our outstanding content, including the weekly Spectator Australia magazine, all the articles in our online section, Flat White, and great international authors like Douglas Murray, Brendan O'Neill, James Dellingpole, and many, many others. Just call 1-800-809-233 and quote Spectator Australia TV. China is firmly opposed to U.S. interference in China's internal affairs. We have expressed our staunch opposition to such interference, and we will take firm actions in response. On human rights, we hope that the United States will do better on human rights. China has made steady progress in human rights, and the fact is that there are many problems within the United States regarding human rights, which is admitted by the US itself as well. Now, that was, of course, the first major summit between the Chinese Communist Party and the Biden administration in March this year. You know, I'm old enough to remember when it was Donald Trump who was supposed to be this blundering buffoon who'd embroiled the free world in a war with China. But in the end, Donald Trump was actually treated with deference by Xi Jinping. Not because Xi Jinping liked Donald Trump, quite the opposite in fact, but because in the world's words of Ronald Reagan, you get peace through strength. Joe Biden, by contrast, does not project strength. And not just because he's a doddering geriatric whose cognitive peak came and went sometime in the mid-1990s, it's because he projects not strength, but wokeness. I mean, why would any belligerent power respect a country that doesn't respect itself? It was a murder in the full light of day, and it ripped the blinders off for the whole world to see the systemic racism the Vice President just referred to. The systemic racism is a stain on our nation's soul. In this weekend's edition of The Spectator Australia, Morris Newman goes into detail about the way in which America's biggest enemy is not China, but itself. Let's hear from him now. Morris Newman, how are you? Very well, thanks, Gideon. Good to see you. Uh, great to see you. Now, I loved your piece in The Spectator Australia this week. Um, it's a very, very important piece. And I want to start with uh, a quote that you included by a woman named Lydia Thomas-Greenfield, the US ambassador to the United Nations, who, who said to the UN, 
<clears throat> Slavery is the original sin of America. It's weaved white supremacy and black inferiority into our founding documents and principles. What kind of a message is that to send to the rest of the world? I thought it was an interesting comment to make to the United Nations of all people. And, of course, the Chinese picked up on it and uh, turned it back on the US. Uh, yeah, it is a, an extraordinary uh, comment and it shows a lack of awareness of where America sits in the world today and how other people are viewing America. I found it an astonishing uh, uh, comment. And, of course, uh, it is, hasn't... If she has encountered racism and all the things she talks about during her upbringing, it certainly doesn't seem to have uh, stopped her upward mobility. She seems to have done pretty well. Well, that, that's right, and that's a fair observation. But, I mean, the tenor of the piece really is that uh, amid a great geopolitical conflict, let's face it, that's basically where we are now in, in some sense, uh, the US is not exactly presenting a united front, and you, you very aptly talk about the ways in which the Chinese are using the, web, the, the, the language of wokeness against the West. They are, and uh, they have the moral authority at the moment. I mean, this is quite uh, extraordinary how quickly that turnaround has occurred. Mm. And, of course, what you also know is that Patrice Culler, who is the co-founder of Black Lives Matter, mm. is a self-admitted fan of Mao Zedong. So they've got a uh, fifth columnist uh, who are who is working extremely hard for the the China cause, uh, ripping apart uh, the US fabric. You know, we shouldn't be too pessimistic about the uh, possible showdown with China, China emerging as the world's only superpower, because they have vulnerabilities too. And if history tells us anything, it is that central planning always fails. Uh, monstrous regimes like this uh, tend to fall over. You can suppress human freedom for a while, for, but not forever. So I suppose as somebody who's uh, had a lot of experience in the business world, what are your insights into the pressures that China is facing economically uh, and what, how that feeds into the point you were making about uh, China having to effectively keep moving forward in the form of warfare and conflict uh, to paper over economic cracks? Xi Jinping, I suspect, sees the window that he has to do something about Taiwan closing quite rapidly. I mean, his, his belligerent attitude is causing the West, including the European Union, by the way, and Canada and other countries, to take, take actions which will uh, realign their, their distribution and, and their supply chains. Mm. Uh, clearly, they're too dependent on China, and that is going to have an impact on the economy. Mm. He has a population which is ageing rapidly and is starting to decline. That's another problem he has. It's also creating some issues domestically because it's affected workers who are no longer in jobs. Many of them uh, are at, at the, more or less the retirement age, but their unemployment insurance is really uh, more, more in, uh, more, more, not, not uh, being accessible to the people who need it. Mm. Uh, the other thing is that, the, that China is very highly leveraged and uh, they really uh, don't understand the separation of power between uh, that we have in democracies. And so they feel when they're dealing with a Joe Biden or even a, 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 a Morrison, that they're dealing with similar leaders who are able to decide what to do and what not to do. And uh, so they just go at each other full pelt. But what's happening is they're losing a lot of popular support. It's interesting that, mm -hmm. that three years ago uh, there was a Pew Research Attitudes uh, survey in Australia which showed that uh, support for China was running at 64%. Mm. Three years later, that's now, it's down to 15 mm. Now, what I think Xi Jinping doesn't understand is that sort of loss of support does impact on the policies of democracies because obviously our politicians will react to that. You're, you're right. And I think I was in one of the, uh, I'm in that category of uh, people who went from the 64 to the 15 uh, percent. Uh, I have become extremely 
hawkish on China just over the last few years. And finally, look, the problems you've outlined aren't necessarily contained to the United States, unfortunately. When you have a new national curriculum, basically, that proposes to teach um, school children to be ashamed of their country and that we're nothing but a bunch of white oppressors, uh, when you have uh, absurdly... Uh, you know, nonsensical anti-racism uh, speech codes and all sorts of other things. When you have uh, the fact that we're argue, you know, we're having all these problems going on internationally, and we're getting hung up on things like pronouns. Um, how worried should we be about Australia's uh, unity and strength in the face of this threat? Well, extremely worried because what it does is to eat away at the fabric. It destroys values and pride in one's culture and the achievements that we have made. I mean, one of the things about that really did surprise me about the ambassador, who, as I say, has risen apparently from, po from poverty to be the US representative at the United Nations, which I would have thought was a, a reasonable promotion, uh, that uh, she is able to decry and demean the United States, its achievements. And as I say in that piece, there will be no civil war in China to end slavery. Mm. And we know there is slavery in China at the present time. Yeah. There will be, be no equal opportunity laws which will be enforced as they are in the United States. We won't get the equity which we see in the, in the, uh, the, the, the application of the law in the United States. Uh, so that same sort of thing applies to Australia and, uh, I find it extraordinary that a country that has been so successful and has, has been able to absorb people from so many places. And again, Australia and the United States is seen as a very, very desirable destination for the oppressed of the world. So that wouldn't seem to me, I don't see them flocking to China or to Iran or North Korea. Well, that's exactly right. Well, look, we will rise to this challenge. Beneath it all, we should be optimistic. Freedom defeated fascism before, and it will again. But in the meantime, Morris Newman, thank you so much for coming on. We always love hearing a great common sense take on the issues that matter. And well done again on your terrific piece in this weekend's Thanks. edition of The Spec. Thank you very much. And now let's hear what you had to say in the comments section of last week's video. Paul writes, great interview with Alexandra Marshall. Her Spectator Australia article is fantastic. Well, thank you, Paul. We love having Alexandra on this show. She is a big fan favourite, and you're absolutely right. Her piece on human rights abuses in China is outstanding, a true must read. You can read it by clicking the link in the show notes down below or heading over, as always, to spectator.com.au. Uh, and our friend Randy Z liked my observation that we can't keep paying the mortgage off with the credit card. Well, thank you, Zed, but I can't actually take credit for that one. It was actually something someone said to me when I worked for the Abbott government around the time of the 2014 budget. Remember that? They were right then and we're right now. And now it's time to hear from Spectator Australia covers editor, Sarah Dudley. Sarah, how are you this week? I'm great, Kitty, and how are you? I'm very, very well. Now, uh, it's another UK uh, edition this week, another UK cover. So talk us through uh, their take on what's happening in the Middle East at the moment. Yes, Gideon, it's a rather inflammatory cover, quite literally. There's a masked youth and he's standing in front of a wall of flames, hurling missiles while he's being filmed on an iPhone. And that image could end up on the social media platform TikTok, mm. um, which has about 730 million users. Uh, and it galvanizes protests from both sides. Last month, um, a video on TikTok in search of likes, um, it encouraged the hunting of Orthodox Jews in order to humiliate and assault them in Jerusalem. Mm. Well, as you can imagine, that sparked protests, which then escalated. Um, and that was all in an attempt to get likes and views you know, on the social media platform. Now that could have been YouTube or Facebook. Um, and, you know, people might think that these platforms are just fun, but they play an incendiary role in fostering violence. And it's absolutely impossible, Gideon, at the moment, not to see footage of Gaza and Israel. Mm. And it's presented with zero balance. Um, and 
um, it's actually even worse than the mainstream media mm. who do occasionally, you know, attempt their truth. No, you're right, Sarah, absolutely, and it was a brilliant uh, cover. Now, it's not the first time we have talked about something that came from uh, the Spectator office in London for the front cover. The last one featured Boris Johnson in the middle of a uh, bad dream, part of which was related to an expensive interior decorating bill that uh, created a bit of a scandal that uh, engulfed uh, number 10 Downing Street. So I think you've got a bit of a, an update for us on that story. Yes, I do indeed, Gideon. Well, you know, I I presented it, um, the cover, a couple of weeks ago. Bojo was embroiled in these financial scandals, um, not least the amount of money that he was spending on doing the interior update of um, 11 Downing Street. Mm. And I pointed out that he's entitled to spend his own money on absolutely what he wants, and that that actually wasn't the real scandal. The real scandal was his fiance's incredibly gaudy taste in <laughs> wallpaper <laughs> and soft furnishings. Um, and Gideon, it seems like I wasn't the only one. The walls of Downing Street are actually protesting. Yes, the walls themselves are fighting back. They have actually rejected Carrie Simon's $1,500 a roll of wallpaper. Is that right? Which is peeling off as fast as it can. Um, well, more power to the <laughs> walls, I say. But, you know, I wonder if it was the neo-colonial, you know, sort of um, pseudo-Raj styling or if it was the vast amounts of taxpayers' money that actually went into that renovation as well that um, – the walls objected to. Yeah, it's as big as belief you're going to pay what it was, a $15,000 a roll for this wallpaper and you won't stump up for the proper glue to No, put no, it no, on. $1,500. Oh, okay. Well, still, you know, that's still a lot. Yeah, that's, that's an awful lot of money. Yeah, well, that, that's still a lot of money, not quite 15000 but you're not going to spend money on the glue to hold it on. I mean, that seems a bit, uh, a bit of a shoddy job to me. But anyway, Sarah, thank you so much for coming on. Great front cover uh, from the UK, guys, and looking forward to catching up next week. Yeah, you too, get in. And now let's see what else we have on offer for Spectator Australia subscribers this weekend. James Allen obliterates last week's horror show of a budget. Great piece there. Ramesh Thakur gives Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi credit for resisting calls to put Indians under lockdown. Over at Flat White, Edie Wyatt gives us her take on breast, sorry, I mean chest feeding. And in our world section, Spectator editor Fraser Nelson takes a look at Sweden's controversial coronavirus response, suggesting that the, that the Swedes may be proved right in in the end. In fact, I suspect they will. Links to all those stories will be in the show notes in the description below or just head straight on over to spectator.com.au. And remember to start today with all the information you need to make sense of this cuckoo clock of a world. Sign up for Morning Double Shot, your free daily email of commentary and Spectator Australia highlights arriving in your inbox at 7am each and every morning. Just head on over to spectator.com.au to sign up. Time for a bit of woke watching now, starting with the news that Amazon's upcoming remake of Cinderella will feature Billy Porter as the fairy godmother. Of course it will. Because these days you can't do anything unless it challenges gender stereotypes or whatever the hell. Okay, well, by that logic, Amazon should be rushing out a reboot of the movie Shaft, starring Angela Lansbury. But in better news, Queensland's Crime and Corruption Commission gave a win to the bleeding obvious recently, releasing a report which found that Queensland's now abandoned 50-50 gender recruitment split in the police resulted in unfair discrimination against men and, under and undermined the credibility of female officers. Like I said, the bleeding obvious. Now, The Spectator Australia's resident satirist, James McPherson, has written a brilliant piece on this for Flat White this week, asking us to think of all the poor criminals who will miss out on having a woke, gentler police force. Let's chat to him now. James McPherson, how are you? Very well, Gideon. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for coming on because I have absolutely loved your writing in Flat White recently. You've got some great, great satirical pieces. And one of them that I wanted to talk about today is your piece on the Queensland police. So set the scene for us. What, what's the woke lunacy that's in the, the Queensland police of all the damn things? Well, a number of years ago, the then Queensland Police Commissioner decided it was incredibly important that the police service had gender parity. That is, 50% of recruits should be male and 50% female. So they embarked on this process but just last week, the Crime and Corruption Commission 
tabled a report in the Queensland Parliament saying that the 50-50 gender recruitment strategy had led to the appointment of female officers who were cognitively, physically and psychologically below standard. Moreover, uh, 200 meritorious men were rejected from the police force in in favour of female candidates who, though unsuited to the police force, were nevertheless employed in order to achieve gender balance. So um, the practice has now stopped, but it just occurred to me that there would be two groups of people very upset by an end to gender parity in the police force. One, all of those woke types who think that diversity is a inherent good no matter what. But second, criminals in Queensland yeah. will be devastated because this is a great blow, not just to women's rights, but to thievery. Yeah, co- correct. I, I love that the the piece from the criminals' point of view, saying, "No, no, we like the woke police. We, you know, we're sick of white straight men busting down the doors of our meth labs." It's a very, very funny piece. But backing up to that report, so you said physically uh, incapable officers were appointed, and that's understandable. We know, you know, as much as people don't want to admit it sometimes that men and women are physically different, but psychologically and uh, intellectually, that sounds like very, very dangerous ground. So explain that one to us. Yes, it wasn't that women per se are intellectually or psychologically um, unsuited, but uh, the number of applicants for a role in the police force was not sufficient for the women who would naturally pass the test to fill the 50% quota. Mm. Therefore, they had to uh, find more women, and so they went back to women who had failed the uh, cognitive or the psychological test and invited them to reapply, which was actually against Queensland Police guidelines. The guidelines state that if you fail your uh, application process, you've got to wait 12 months before you can reapply. But what the crime and... uh, Corruption Commission found was that failed applicants were invited to reapply immediately and were put straight into the police force because they just needed to get the numbers up. Do we have any idea of what the rates of application to the police force are between men and women? Because I dare say that more men apply to the police force than women. It's just a, a job that I would imagine inherently appeals to men. It's very dangerous. It's quite, uh, you know, blokey in a way. It requires a lot. Of, you know, it's go, going out to catch the bad luck, guys. These are traditionally masculine uh, traits. But I guess what quotas do is they... They, they rob uh, the organisation trying to hire of the flexibility to choose the best people of any gender. Correct. Uh, the, the report itself uh, stated that typically 70% of all applicants were male. So you're trying to fill 50% of places uh, with females, yet they represent only 30% of applicants. Anyway, uh, James McPherson, love your writing uh, in flat white. Please, please keep it up. And thanks again for joining us here on Counterculture. I really appreciate you having me. Thanks, Gideon. Well, this program is a co-production of the Institute of Public Affairs. For 78 years, the IPA has been Australia's voice for freedom, democracy and the Australian way of life. We fight for freedom of speech, the power of the free market, an honest debate on climate change and the timeless value of Western civilization. We don't receive a cent from the government and are not beholden to nervous advertisers. We speak out only because of the support of the thousands of great patriotic Australians who are proud, paid up IPA members. So sign up now to the Institute of Public Affairs to support our research, as well as exclusive benefits like priority access and discounts to IPA events, our quarterly magazine, the IPA Review, our weekly email roundup for freedom enthusiasts called Hey, What Did I Miss? Regular updates from Executive Director John Roskam offering his take on the tough issues of the week, policy updates from our gun research team giving you all the ammunition you need to own that lifty mate at your next insufferable dinner party, and some merch as well. And of course, and of course on top of all that, you'll be supporting the IPA's work in defending freedom freedom, democracy and the Australian way of life. Just head on over to ipa.org.au forward slash join, sign up today and join Australia's voice for freedom. Well, that's it for today's edition of Counterculture right here on Spectator Australia TV. All Spectator Australia content and IPA research featured today is available in the show notes down below. Remember to sign up for more regular updates with Morning Double Shot over at spectator.com.au and remember to access all the content from the Spectator Australia. Just call 1-800-809-233 and quote Spectator Australia TV. Until next week, friends. Spectator Australia TV.